Good morning. Welcome to the Morning Devo with Bo Willette. Bo O, that's my name. And you can check out the archives always at the YouTube channel just there. It'll be on the scroller. Not only will that be on the scroller, right there it is, um, but also my good friends at A Reason for Hope every weekday, 5 to 6 o'clock, um, your Bible questions answered. So if somehow going through the Devo sparks a question, you can just at 5 o'clock get on this same Facebook channel and send a question, and my friends will love to answer it. Now we're in Ephesians chapter 3. Super excited to go through this. And we're, we're going to start in verse 7. It says, By God's grace and mighty power, I have been given the privilege of serving him by spreading this good news. So this is Paul saying, man, I, I feel privileged. And I hope this morning I feel privileged to be able to spread this good news. Now, it's kind of interesting, but everybody that has an ideology or has an, a, a thought or an opinion, they feel privileged to be able to share that good news, that news. Now, the one that we are sharing is one that is promoting what we call eternal life. Isn't that interesting? That might be the difference between like different, uh, wi different education um, classes that are taught and what we're teaching um, and what we call religion um, is we're teaching a way of salvation. Now, a lot of ways of salvation, even in religious circles, are ones where you have to perform a set of rules or laws. And I can't really think of any that doesn't have that kind of idea where there has to be something you have to tap into or there's some kind of thing that you need to do to accomplish a goal where Christianity is kind of odd in that it says you can do nothing. It says it is a gift from God. We are saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So in Christianity, the idea is that the only boast we can make is in the glory of God or in the goodness of God or in the mercy of God or, of course, in the grace of God. And so Christianity has a message a good news, and that one has to do uh, with eternal salvation. And again, it's different from others, right? And so just as, uh, you know, on the world scene, there's different social movements that are trying to educate and they feel they are right. Well, Christianity is doing that too. And there was a time that there was, that Christianity was not the, um, what, uh, the the power. It wasn't the thing in, in control, right? There was a time where Jesus was nailed on a cross and the disciples were killed and Paul was beheaded and uh, Christian persecution. Cr Christians were thrown into um, uh, a play uh, into the Colosseum where they would be literally ripped to shreds by animals and um, as inter for entertainment purposes. Uh, so, um, you know, it's funny how people today are wanting to educate people to get rid of the Christian influence in uh, our country and in other countries. But there was a time where it was the opposite. And uh, I think sometimes we fail to remember history that uh, there was a time where Christianity was the oppressed group. And Paul is writing, the reason why I say that is because Paul's writing in jail. He's writing from jail. He is the oppressed group. The oppressors were those that didn't, didn't live the way that Christians were living. And that's how the world lived, not in the ways of Christianity, not in the ways of following Christ or Christ principles, Christ word. So... Um, Paul is the oppressed group, and he is in jail. And and what does he do, though? By God's grace and mighty power. Do you see that? He's in jail. God's grace and mighty power. <laughs> awesome, right? Nothing, nothing throws off, you know, God. And I got to remember that this morning. Paul says elsewhere, I think it's in the book of 2 Timothy. You can test me on that. And it's good for you to test me on that. But uh, he says, though I am chained, the word of God is not. 
And that's good to know. Paul was chained, but he says the word of God is not. And even though he was in jail, he knew that by God's grace and mighty power that had been, he'd been given a privilege of serving him by spreading this good news. What a privilege it is to be able to share this unique salvation, right? This really unique salvation with people. One that it, it, they do not need to perform good works to enter into the kingdom of heaven, but they need to be born anew, born again. They need to come to Christ, receive Christ, receive the salvation that has been given to them to be born from above, right? And it says, though I am least deserving of all God's people, humility, right? A reality of who we really are. There's a humility there in Paul. He graciously gave me the privilege of telling the Gentiles about the endless treasure treasures. Another great underlining word, right, in the New Living Translation. The endless treasures available to them in Christ. Do you see Christ Jesus as an endless treasure? Endless treasure, that's hard for me to fathom, right? Looking in your bank account and it just keeps the numbers, the zeros just keep growing, <laughs> right? It's an endless amount. It just keeps on going, an infinity. This is the idea of infinity. And this is what why Blaise Pascal, the um, mathematician and scientist and theologian talks about God as the infinity, right? Because it's an endless treasure. So whatever I'm going through today, can Jesus meet all my needs? Can he help me? You know, does he have everything that I need to sustain me and to give me peace, uh, to give me a, a balance in my life? Um, yeah, he, he can teach me. He can help me. You know, and this is why the psalm says, right, whom have I in heaven but you? And you guys can finish it. But on the earth, there is nothing I desire besides you. My heart and flesh may fail, but you are the strength in my portion forever. You guys remember that. Yeah, he had endless treasures. I was chosen to explain to everyone this mysterious plan of God, the creator of all things, had kept secret from the beginning. So there's an unveiling that Paul is excited to share. And he talked about this, right? The the, the unification of people. All people can be saved. We can't do that through law because not all people can keep the law. But we can do it through the person of Christ, right? We can do it through the Messiah by belief, by faith in Christ. See, that's the equalizer. We can all trust the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says, uh, this was the eternal plan which he carried out through Christ Jesus our Lord. Because of Christ and our faith in him, we can now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. In the Old Testament, they couldn't come boldly and they could not come confidently into God's presence. If you read the book of Leviticus, the book of Numbers, quite a bit too, you'll read that it was quite a scary thing to come into the presence of a holy God. And whenever they were going to make that yearly sacrifice and the priest the high priest was going to bring that blood of that sacrifice into the most holy of holies in the tabernacle or the temple that was quite a fearful day indeed who knows what's going to happen is god going to strike me down is god going to overlook my own sin how can i come into the presence of holiness and not feel corroded not feel corrupted and But now it says all of our corrosion, all of our sins, though they be as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Whoa, as white as snow. See, people can make you feel down about a lot of things, right? You go to, you go to college and you sit in a classroom and the professor rips on something that you think's right. And he makes you th feel bad about it, man. You start going, man, I'm really, man, maybe I'm off. And da -da -da -da. Well, just think about coming into the presence of a perfect being. Right? That's the idea of God and how you would feel. God, everything in you would be revealed. Right, you, The frailty that you have as a human being. Um, and uh, yeah, 
so there's much to say about that frailty. Uh, but you know what I mean. We are frail people. And But now we can come through the blood of Christ because we are forgiven. Now we can actually come before the Father as children and as beloved children. So we can come boldly and confidently into God's presence. So we can come in prayer to God. Uh, we can come into that place of communion with God, with fellowship, koinonia with God. God has made a way for us to bridge the gap. So please do not lose heart because of my trials here. I am suffering for you so f- so you should feel honored. <laughs> so Paul says, "Hey, I'm in I'm in this prison because of you guys because I preach this way to you Gentiles. And uh man, you guys should feel stoked. You guys should feel honored." So he says, "Don't lose heart because of where I'm at." And uh, sometimes we can lose heart. Think of w- ways that you lose heart today. What are ways that you kind of have that, um, you know, you watch something and you kind of lose heart of where the world's at and you kind of go, oh, man. You know, well, Paul, who was the oppressed group back in the day, you know, he's sitting there going, hey, don't lose heart at where I'm at. You know, God's got a plan. God's got a purpose. Man, he, he, I feel privileged to be able to proclaim this wonderful good news. So I hope we do too. Now, Paul gives a wonderful prayer at the end of this chapter. And this is uh, another prayer of Paul. We went over one, I think it was in Colossians chapter one that was awesome. But hear this one. When I think of all this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father. So what does Paul do when he thinks about Jesus and he thinks about the unification between Jewish people and Gentile people and all the conflicts with laws and all the religious laws and the social laws and everything that divided people and put people in oppressed oppressor groups and all these things like that. Paul saw all of it united in Jesus Christ, that all of us truly are people that need Christ and need saving. And so what does Paul do? He falls on his knees. Isn't that cool? He falls on his knees and he, he understands the plan of God that it's through Jesus Christ that we all now can come before the Father. And he says, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father. Isn't that great? He is showing that he can come boldly at this point and that he doesn't have to fear and that he can come in a confident way to the Father. He falls on his knees, right? An act of saying, God, I need you. I want you. Um, You know, maybe today I need to get on my knees a little more, right? Nothing's wrong with getting on my knees and seeking the Lord. And it says, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. Now, the Bible gives us uh, an ideology as well, Um, um, a narrative. And the narrative is this, God is the creator of everything on heaven and earth. However people define terms nowadays, God's got definitions too. <laughs> and so who we're going to who we going to look to? Well, it says God is first the creator of everything, of heaven and on earth. So that means that in 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 tells me this morning that I have a purpose. If I'm created, then there's purpose, right? If a TV is created, it's created by someone who has a purpose in its design, right? When a house is built, it's built by a builder, and the builder has a design. When a car is made, you get the point. Everything has a design, a purpose. And so even when we get to our cellular levels, right, in our bodies, how unique our molecules are working, everything has a structure and a way of doing things a super duper design. And uh, we have not only hardware in our system, but we got software in our system, right? Just like a computer, right? You think of a computer, how, you know, you have software, you have hardware, um, all these kind of things. And it's like us, there's all kinds of design. Would you say a computer's not designed? Would you say it's just random? That would make no sense. It's super duper designed. Well, we have a creator and The Bible starts with that. Um, In the beginning, God created. God's the creator. This really focuses back this morning on God. 
I pray f- that from his glorious unlimited resources, <laughs> man, that's awesome, unlimited resources, again, numbers don't end, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. He's going to help you. He's going to get you through. Um, he's going to empower you. Empower us to what? Well, it says through the spirit. So it obviously it's a spiritual work. It's something uh, that has to do with the things of God, if you will. That's maybe a simple way to point put it. God creates us to be in fellowship with him, fellowship with him. The spirit of God hovered over the face of the earth, right? Genesis, we keep going back there. And God has, it says, he's going to empower us with that spirit. That's pretty radical. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. So isn't this cool? He's going to empower you with inner strength. And then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. So as we trust in Christ, he makes uh, his home with us. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. Isn't that cool? We're just, as we keep trusting in him. Now, a lot of people didn't have the Bible where Paul was writing. And we tend to think, oh, man, that means stay in the word and we have the Bible. Well, yeah, that's true. We are super privileged today to have Bibles. Um, back then, they didn't. They had to go to places like a synagogue to hear the scriptures read. Other than that, they had to trust. They had to trust the person of Jesus Christ, literally lean on anything they heard about him um, and his power, that God was a Jesus Christ. God, through his son, Jesus Christ, was going to empower those people. You know, sometimes we just tend to, we tend to, I think, <clears throat> you know, look to this so much, this piece of paper, where we don't realize that, <clears throat> you know, this is written by the Spirit of the living God. And even if we didn't have the written word, Bible's telling us that, you know what, we will be empowered by the word, word, the Spirit, that which is the speaker of the word, right? Jesus says, you know, what does the Spirit say? You know, when he's talking about the word, what does the Spirit say? You know, and that's cool because that means, you know, it's a spiritual work within me that needs to happen. That even if I'm all alone <clears throat> and I don't have anything and I'm in prison like Paul, the spirit of the living God will empower me <clears throat> and he will reside in me. And the love that he has for me will take root and grow and it'll take root in the soil of my heart. And man, I will blossom. Reminds me of Psalm chapter 1 a little bit, right? I will delight in the law of the Lord. I will meditate day and night. Then like a tree firmly planted, I'll be grounded in your word. Yeah. So kind of cool. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And you may have the power to understand all of, with all of God's people <clears throat> how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. So that's a great verse, verse 18, that you may have the power to understand. What a great prayer for all of us, right? We need power to understand the amazing love that God has for us. It'll never be exhausted. All of heaven, we will be thinking and, and contemplating the incredible love that God has for us to bridge the gap um, that Jesus has bridged between a holy God and us that bridge, that length of that bridge will be the measuring of how how long it will take for us to really grab everything in heaven because, I mean, that is a huge bridge. That bridge goes on forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, you know, in, in a figurative sense, you know, um, meaning there was such, there's such a difference between me and God and Jesus, his love has won the day. And I love that. Um, I love a good love story, and I'm sure you do too. And that's what the Bible is. It says, may you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to fully understand. So even Paul could not fully grasp. Right now, he knew in part. He only knew in part. A little bit, right? A little bit. Right? And it says, then you will be made complete with all the fullness of, 
of life and power that comes from God. So we understand a little bit. It is too great to understand his love fully. Then you will be able to, but man, there will be a time. Then we will be able to be, we will be made complete with all the fullness. There will be a complete fullness of life and power that comes from God that will radiate in our minds and our hearts and it will it's beyond understanding fully now all glory to god who is able through his mighty power to work within us to accomplish in infinitely more than we might ask or think and that's cool i like that god is able to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think see god has a greater plan than even what i have for me today um, I might have a plan to serve God, and I might have thoughts on what that's going to look like exactly. But I love this, and that is God has a plan that's even greater than my plan. It's infinitely more than what we can ask or what we might ask or think. So whatever we might come up with, his mighty power within us is going to be greater than that that thought I have. It's going to, at some point, be more mighty. He's going to ac accomplish something in me that is going to be revolutionary, that no science can touch it. Um, no cyborg, no genetic uh, whatever, um, you know, manipulation. It is a work in us to create us as new people um, that is going to be just an absolute miracle as one word maybe can sum it up and that's resurrection that kind of power glory to him in the church and christ jesus through all generations forever and ever amen yeah glory in the church now that sounded radical back in paul's day because what was the church they were they were beaten up they were they were living the church was living not like everybody else in the world Everybody else in the world, all the other nations, all the other people groups were living in different ways. Their marriages were different, like their relational lives were different. Everything was different. The way they did everything was different. The Christians were a odd group. And Paul says what? Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. So even in our generation... It should, we should glory in him in the church. What should the church be focused on? Jesus Christ. We should be focused on him. We should think of giving glory to the Father through the work in the Son to us. And that's what we should be about. Um, yeah, I mean, what an amazing turn of events, right? This small group of people um, trusting in the work of Christ and the power uh, to literally alter the world in so many ways. Um, look at where we're at today. Uh, and that's uh, come a long way from Paul writing the book of Ephesians in a jail, um, right, in, uh, in uh, confinement in Rome. I would say there's a lot of mighty power at work going on. And think of how many people have come to know Christ and the love of Christ and, uh, and want to be like Christ. Um, and the message of the gospel has gone out. And this is what we have the privilege of doing and being a part of. Wow. We definitely are a minority group. Um, and, um, and maybe we always will be. Who knows? Um, um, well, that's debatable. There's the millennial, millennial, and then there's heaven. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, you guys take take care. I ended on a real contemplative note there that time. And a really good morning. Hey, Marsha, good to have you in. Michael, hey, Zeus. Um, let's see, I saw, I thought, I saw Casey. I saw Kurt, and that's really cool. It's great to see Kurt on there. And um, man, really, really good stuff. So I'm off, and you guys have a great one. See you tomorrow, Lord willing. Bye-bye.